Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Carlology by Carl Pilkington. What I've learned so far, including pearls of wisdom from Ricky Gervais, Russell Brand, Noel Fielding and more. So as always, I'm going to go through and check out the blurb, then I'm going to go through and look at some of my tabs and I'll share my thoughts and rating at the end. Uh, the thing to note is, if you haven't heard of Carl Pilkington, he's friends with Ricky Gervais basically, and he was a frequent guest on the Ricky Gervais podcast. He's a northern English man with a, a head shaped like an egg, who says lots of weird, funny things. So. Dane reads. Take a voyage through the strange yet mesmerizing void of Carl Pilkington's brain as he embarks on a quest for the knowledge and wisdom he's never had. A search for truth or a descent into bewilderment, genius or madness, you decide. So he's talking about his time at school and he says, for the few years I was there, I can't recall seeing a caretaker. That job was done by kids held back after school for being naughty. Instead of doing lines or reading a book, they'd re-putty windows or rub down and paint door frames. I was held back twice and told to weed the playground. There were some jobs that kids weren't qualified to do, like repairing holes in the roof and walls. So they were just left to get worse, which meant that some of the school's rooms could only be used in certain weather. I was at that school for two or three years before they knocked it down. And apart from one hot summer, I don't think I ever took my coat off. And um, I remember having a detention at school where they held me back and I had to um, help sweep up glass from an old, the floor of an old science room. He talks about um, having music lessons. He said it was so freezing in that room, the maracas shook on their own. And then we learn about what happened when he had a brain scan. I started to feel a bit nervous about coming face to face with my brain. Or was it my brain that felt nervous about me seeing it? I get like this whenever I have any sort of medical test, as the doctors always seem to find something. That's what doctors do. They're like archaeologists who keep digging until they hit bone, or car mechanics who always find something that needs replacing. So I prefer to leave it for as long as possible before having a checkup. The last time I went to the doctors was because Suzanne told me to get a wart checked. I went to the walking clinic in Soho and explained at the reception that I had a wart my girlfriend was worried about. They sent me through to the nurse who read on the note that I had a wart. Without even making eye contact, she asked me to drop my trousers. She was sat down, I was stood up. She stared at my bits for a few moments and did that thing people with glasses do where they squint and then look over the top of the glasses as if she was studying a piece of art. I'm having problems locating it, she said. It's here on the side of my face. Oh, okay, pull your trousers up. She explained that most cases of warts in the Soho clinic were of a sexual nature. She gave me some cream to put on it and the wart fell off within a week, which made me glad that the wart wasn't on me knob. And uh, this is kind of deep in a way, he says, I think it's harder to come up with ideas and solutions now. If these people were around today, they'd struggle. Newton wouldn't be allowed to sit under an apple tree because there'd probably be a keep off the grass sign, or apple trees would have fences around them to stop people nicking the apples. Archimedes wouldn't have a bath due to water shortage and would be advised to shower because it's better for the environment. And as for running down the street naked, he'd be banged up. Things have changed. And he talks about infinity pools, which I thought was interesting because I'd literally just written an article about infinity pools and I still don't really understand what they are. So he's at the Natural History Museum and he writes, The guide said that the museum staff call the Diplodocus Dippy. Humans love naming stuff. When a whale got lost and ended up getting stuck in the River Thames, everyone started coming up with names for it quicker than they came up with solutions to save it. When I was looking on the internet about dinosaurs, I read that a T-Rex found in Montana was named Thomas the T-Rex. We love naming so much that it'll get to a point where you go to the doctors and he says, I'm afraid you got a touch of Colin the Cancer in your lungs. There's a quote here from Frank Zappa, art is making something out of nothing and selling it. And I thought this was cool, so he's, he's talking here about words, because this is from visiting the Tate Modern again. And um, so he says, the leaflet said that the crack is called shibboleth, which, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is a word used as a test for detecting people from another district or country by their pronunciation, a word or a sound very difficult for foreigners to pronounce correctly. The word refers back to an incident in the Bible when the Ephraimites were trying to cross the River Jordan but got caught by their enemies, the Gileadites. The Ephraimites were all forced to say the word shibboleth. Since their dialect doesn't include the shush sound, this allowed the Gileadites to identify and slaughter large numbers of, Ephraim of Ephraimites. The leaflet went on to say how Shibboleth is a token of power, the power to judge and kill. And this was a chuckle as well, so he goes, because he's off to visit London Zoo, and he says, The workers in the zoo were giving me odd looks while preparing for opening time, as I don't think they see that many 35-year-old men waiting for the zoo to open. It was 9.30 and the place didn't open until 10am. Opening times are odd things. There doesn't seem to be any system in London when it comes to opening times. I used to pass a sex shop in Soho on the way to work that was open at 8.30am, ready for any passers-by that needed a butt plug, and yet you might have to wait until 9am for somewhere that will sell you a pint of milk to open. London is odd like that. Some stuff just don't make sense. Berwick Street in Soho is a mix of fruit stores and sex bars as if they work hand in hand. It's quite a rough street. 
All the bananas are full of bruises. So this is from Noel Fielding. This is what I've learned. We have a lot of celebrities co like contributing what they've learned. So he said, bears, before they hibernate, pack their anus with a kind of mud tampon to stop red ants crawling up them and biting and waking them up. So some animal facts here, and I just thought this is a fascinating one here. Um, the world's smallest dog was a Yorkshire Terrier owned by Arthur Marples of Blackburn. Called Sylvia, she lived for two years and reached 2.5 inches tall and 4 ounces in weight. She died in 1945. The quote about the library here by Andrew Ross, he said, The smallest bookstore still contains more ideas of worth than have been presented in the entire history of television. But I don't know if that's true because the smallest bookstore, I think, only has one book in it. He says, while he's in the library, he sees a sign that says, No pets, but blind dogs are welcome. A sign, a sign aimed at the blind is something I've never seen before. A library is the last place I'd thought I'd see a blind person, them and Tourette's sufferers. And he says, All I could hear was a buzz from the fluorescent lights and the odd cough. I associate coughs with libraries and snooker matches, as it's the only time I ever noticed them. And it's true, they are very noticeable when you're watching a snooker match and someone coughs. And he says, what's it, his mum recently bought a tea towel with a map of Anglesey on it from a charity shop. Me dad said, yeah, it'll be handy that if you get lost while doing the washing up. Some facts about books. An estimated 175 million books have been published. If you read one an hour, it would take 19,000 years to read them all. A million new books are published each year, a fifth of them in the UK, which produces more books than any other country. And half of those are me. All right, then we have David Icke here. So he's a famous conspiracy theorist and his contribution to what I've learned. That the world is controlled by a network of interbreeding families seeking to impose a global Orwellian dictatorship through their puppet governments, corporations, banks and media empires. That the world we think is real and solid is actually an illusion that we decode from frequency fields into holographic, illusory 3D reality. Much like a television decodes frequencies into pictures and a computer decodes electrical and mathematical data into websites on the screen, etc. The great American comedian and deep thinker Bill Hicks captured it all when he said, as part of a joke, matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream and we're the imagination of ourselves. And that joke, the context of that joke was he was saying, why don't they ever have positive drug stories on the news? Like, why don't you have somebody on magic mushrooms who discovered that? And here's some facts about Egypt. He says, cats were sacred in ancient Egypt. When a cat died, the owner shaved his eyebrows as a sign of mourning and had the cat's body mummified. Killing a cat, whether deliberately or by accident, carried the death penalty, as it should. Well, maybe not, that's a bit extreme, but you know. So here we have another what I've learned. This is from Richard Bacon. My facts are about lifts. Otis, the oldest and largest manufacturer of lifts in the world, carries the equivalent of the world's population every five days. Can any other company claim that many people use its products so regularly? Those 6.6 .6 billion people are also lied to every five days because the door close button on lifts doesn't actually do anything. It's there to make you think you have control. Does any other company mislead that many people so regularly? No one has died from the cables snapping and a lift free fall into the ground since 1945. And finally, hatches in the ceilings of lifts never open from the inside. Films lie. So he says here, uh, I also think it's harder to get something in the history books these days because there's now been so much history that there will always be something a bit more impressive that occurred on the same date in the past. An example of history getting in the way is people whose birthday is on December 25th. They never seem happy about it. There's no point trying to do something special on your birthday if you were born on December 25th, as it will always be better known for the birth of baby Jesus. Another example is the way me mum and dad's birthday is on the same day. They're never happy that I get them one card between them both. I used to have a friend whose birthday was on Christmas Day and he actually sadly passed away when he was only about 19. So every every Christmas I think about that and particularly I think about his mum and how, how tough Christmas must be for her, you know. He talks about snooker again, which is one of my favourite sports. He says, he says, I prefer the slower sports like snooker. My mum hates snooker and thinks it could be over a lot quicker if they got rid of the bloke who keeps taking the balls out of the pockets and putting them back on the table. And this I do agree with him here. He says, um, I don't think a meal or snack should take more than double the time to make as it takes to eat. This is why I'm not a fan of oranges. The taste of an orange isn't good enough to compensate for the hassle of peeling it. Very true. All in all, Carlology by Carl Pilkington. It was a lot of fun, very humorous. Uh, probably like a week four out of five for me. Um, it's not super serious, but at the same time, you will kind of learn stuff from it as well. It's just one of those good little books that only take you a couple of days to read and it'll make you smile. So what more could you ask for? So there we have it, that's what I made of Carlology by Carl Pilkington. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.